The end of censorship means the end of neoliberalism. Watch as cable news personalities come to that terrifying realization. Is there any danger in a Twitter owned by Elon Musk? Misinformation and disinformation could be amplified considerably. I don't think anyone disagrees it should be a free and open uh, debate or, or platform, mm -hmm. but I mean, should it be a necessarily a font for misinformation? Liberals are concerned that this will further open the floodgates for hate speech and disinformation. I don't think we actually want an anything goes Twitter because we've seen that white supremacists and conspiracy theorists are willing to use the platform to spread lies and disinformation. Are you concerned that what Musk is trying to do is to open up the platform for more misinformation about topics such as COVID-19 and the 2020 election? <laughs> the best is that a woman from a group called Free Press spent her cable news hit arguing against a free press. But no irony alarms went off. Those have been disabled. Notice that virtually every person you saw in that montage fretted aloud about the threat of misinformation. If people are allowed to talk, they'll tell you the wrong things about, say, COVID-19. Well, Naomi Wolf has spent the last two years taking a deep and forensic look into COVID-19 and our response to it and the media's coverage of it. She's written a fantastic new book called The Bodies of Others about it. She joins us tonight to assess the claims of misinformation. Naomi Wolf, well, thank you so much for coming on. So they're fretting about the idea that our social media platforms, our media itself, could be flooded with misinformation about, say, COVID. Are you concerned about that? I'm concerned that we're having this conversation in the United States of America. Right, um, it exactly. used to be that we all understood that we had a First Amendment. It came first because everything else depends on it. And yes. you're not supposed to create restrictions uh, or chill speech. And, and the news media used to be the people who understood best that you're supposed to allow space for even unpopular discussion, even controversial discussion. I remember that in America, we used to talk about true or untrue. Something was either a fact or it was not a fact. And what's so Orwellian about this discourse about misinformation and disinformation, and I think Jen Psaki even came up with malinformation, is that it's not whether it's true or untrue, it's whether it's naughty thinking or wrong think. Um, and that is un-American. That's much more more like a CCP style socialist environment in which you can't go against those in power. You can't go against the state. Um, and that's a catastrophic situation. It's such an insightful point that you just made, because what you're saying is that truth is no longer a defense. Well, exactly. And I mean, these people aren't saying God forbid they someone might say something that's factually inaccurate, in which case in America, we, you know, shine light on that so that factual accuracy can prevail, right? Sunlight right. is the best disinfectant. No, that's not what they're saying. And listen to how there's this slippery slope they've created. Um, they all mention a hate speech, right? Well, in just the last couple of years, speech that we might not like or that people like us think is, you know, sexist or racist or wrongheaded or homophobic, that's been turned into hate speech. And then hate speech has become a slippery slope into white supremacist discourse and thus violence and a threat to democracy. So that's all been collapsed and it's been collapsed intentionally so that people will be scared to have open, robust, uh, you know, American conversations where people who disagree with each other uh, respectfully or disrespectfully disagree. I mean, if you want to see real open debate, all you need to do is go back to the way our founding fathers newspapers used to cover events or yeah. the way newspapers covered events into the first half of the 19th century in our country. Um, there was so much, you know, open debate, name calling, um, kinds of discourse that wouldn't even be allowed today. But Jefferson and others understood that that was vitally important in order to keep our democracy safe. So it's a very totalitarian thing to say that speech is violence and the left is doing it and I'm ashamed of that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's fascinating if you compare the debate over the Iraq war and I'll admit right out loud, I was on the wrong side of that debate, but there was a debate. I mean, there was a, there was an actual debate. Two sides went up against each other and, you know, one prevailed. But you don't see any debate whatsoever about the current war uh, that we're involved in. You saw really no debate about COVID-19. You don't see any real debate about the biggest issues in our country. 
And that's partly the the real danger of these tech companies being the town square. And also, I would say, lockdown intensified that because we were forbidden to gather in town halls or churches or synagogues or in really in the street or in our homes and talk to each other. And so we were all driven onto these tech platforms. And I run a tech company. The kind of censorship you can engage in on a tech platform is very yeah. insidious because it can be invisible. You can censor people by shadow banning or by algorithms or Google just syncing certain results or raising certain others. So it's not as visible as a pile of books being burned in a German square in the 1930s. Um, and so we don't even know what we don't know on these tech platforms. Super scary. You become such an important voice on this. I really appreciate it. Emmy Wolf, thank you. Thank you.